So we will try to express now after that uh, qualifying statement, motivating ourselves to write the numbers in terms of the number dense, actual number densities times the quantum mechanical current densities. So this sigma is n, the number of particles per unit volume times the J incident in here, incident flux. We have seen that the denominator was the incident flux. Therefore, it is the number, actual number density times the probability current density. Obviously, it is just the modulus of it, right? The magnitude of it. What about the upper expression? It is the number of particles moving into the solid angle the omega. So before writing it, let me plot the picture again once more. Here is the incoming beam, which are a collection of three particles. Then they move here in this direction and going through the detector. And we would like to consider this solid angle centered about the x. At the center of it, there is the X. Here is the detector we are looking at. The solid angle. That's the solid angle, the omega. And this is the number. Say, consider the associated uh, It's difficult. Perhaps I should throw it a little larger here. DA. What is the relationship of this DA or the DA be considered in here? Perhaps it's much better to consider the DA at the detector. Because it is the, at the detector. DA, number of particles going through the, the solid angle, the omega, which are reaching the detector. So we are taking the DA, the infinitesimal area, at the detector. So what is this relationship between the DA, the area in here, and the solid angle, the omega, and the distance, R? DA is R squared, the omega, right? It's obviously. How do I know that? It's easy. If 4 pi solid angle is associated with the 4 pi R squared area, then the omega is associated with the r squared, the omega as such. Primary school relationship, right? So or then the number of particles going through there per unit time is number of particles crossing dA is going to be equal to, repeat that same argument, put a cylinder based on dA and per unit time, therefore the height of the cylinder or the height of the cone will be just V, that's how the V comes in, so V dA times n, n is the number of particles per unit volume. This is the volume of the cylinder. And dA is r squared the, the omega, so r squared the omega, and the v as we have the, demonstrated in that example previously, it is related to the probability current density, j scattered, times the number, number density is the same, right? The, the, the same number of particles come in, passes through, and go out. We don't lose any number, right, of particles escaping to the infinity or getting lost or eaten up somewhere. So n is here. Therefore, this is the quantity I have to substitute up. So n r squared the omega j 
can. The ends, as I said, due to the conservation of the number of particles, they cancel automatically on the numerator and denominator. And you see what is left over is the ratio of these scattered J and the incident J, and there is the omega multiplying this. The usually, the conventional differential cross-section is defined as the ratio of d sigma to d omega. That is the number of, all this definition per unit solid angle instead of this d omega solid angle. So it becomes r squared j scattered divided by j incident. So whenever you see any scattering the quantum scattering theory book, you see this, this expression given automatically. So I try to give you the reason, the rationale for constructing this, connecting the, the, the quantum mechanical concepts like probability densities and current densities, and the actual numbers and actual fluxes. So you see, it is the quantum mechanical quantities appearing in the right hand side. That's the miracle. This is actual physically measurable differential cross section in terms of the numbers and everything. This is the quantum mechanical. Isn't that a great achievement? Beautiful achievement, really that we could connect these two things to each other. Well, once that is understood, it is one of the most, most subtle subjects. <laughs> A lot more difficult than that complicated integrals that we have carried out last time. Mathematics is easy, it's trivial. What is difficult is to appreciate, to understand the real meaning of these simple concepts. So you see I'm putting more emphasis on these physical concepts really. So let's see the use of the advantage of the expression we have written for this full solution in terms of a scattering amplitude. Let's compute this expression using that full solution of the scattering problem. What is the, what do we read there? We see that incident the function is 2 pi to the minus 3 halves times e to the i kx, right? We have said that this represents the incoming one. This represents the scattered spherical symmetric one. So what is this scattering solution? 2 pi to the minus 3 halves times <coughs> f times e to the i k r divided by r. So let me compute those things. The current density, probability current density is also associated with scattering and associated with the incident wave functions. And let's see what we get for that. So j incident is h bar over 2 mi psi star incident del psi incident minus the complex conjugate, right? Let's compute this. I let me take this and take the gradient of it. Psi incident is 2 pi to the minus 3 halves times, if I, when I take the gradient, it brings down i k. I k times e to the i k dot x, simply. Now let me multiply this with the psi star. The psi star is the same expression with a minus sign, and that minus, due to that minus sign, it kills this. So what do I have? Psi star del psi incident is equal to the same 2 pi to the minus 3 halves comes in, therefore 2 pi to the minus 3 I k, as simple as this. So what is the j incident then? j incident is h power over 2 mi times this thing minus its conjugate. Its conjugate has a minus sign in the front i and the minus of the minus is plus Therefore, twice i k times 2 pi to the minus 3. 
Well, let's write this cleanly so that you don't get confused. It's the K vector. So two I's cancel, and you have H bar K divided by M, as I have indicated in the previous argument. So this is your J incident. And let me compute now the J scattering. The, the expression is the same. It is these things will be replaced by the scattering and scattering. So it is, let me not repeat the same expression. We have to repeat the same with the second expression. So let me, it is a bit more involved because obviously it's spherically fronted. So we have to be careful in taking the derivative. So what do I need? Del psi scatter is equal to 2 pi to the minus 3 halves times f. f doesn't depend on r. It is the k and k prime, right? It's a constant thing as far as space variables are concerned. The del e to the i k r divided by r. Okay. So let me take this rivet, radiant really. What is this? It is minus one over r squared times the gradient of r times e to the i k r plus one over r times e to the i k delta of e to the i k r. So it is i k the gradient of r times e to the i k r, right? It is a rather complicated expression. I have taken the chain, used the chain rule in taking the gradient of this. Here, what do I need? I need this explicit expression of this gradient of r. Gradient of r is the unit vector r. Is there any of you in the class who wants me to demonstrate this explicitly? It's a rather trivial two minutes exercise. Shall I? No need, okay, you can all do that. So then this expression is, delta R is our unit. So, e to the i k r divided by r, e to i k times r hat. I have just written this, really. So what is left over, what is left over is, minus 1 over r squared, i k, sorry, let me keep the i k in. i k minus 1 over r squared. That is the expression. So let me multiply this with this psi star now. Psi star times delta psi scattering case, of course, if you want to put the SCs down. So, there is 2 pi to the minus 3 halves from both, so it is 2 pi to the minus 3 times, there's F star and F, F mode squared, and there is a minus E to the KR from the first one, and e to the plus i k r r from this new one times r unit i k one over r squared. Sorry, as the one over r is factored here, one over r only. Let's correct this. Because it was one over r squared, then one over r, I factored the one over r only. Besides, dimensionally, it's incorrect because k r is dimensionless, k has the inverse dimension r, so this is a consistent expression. So this is the expression I obtained. There are obviously some cancellations. That cancels, and we have then 2 pi to the minus 3 times f mod squared times r hat divided by r squared i k minus 1 over r. A simplified, beautifully simplified expression for the psi star times the gradient of psi. 
So I'm now prepared to write the current associated current density, which is an additional factor in the front, obviously. So J scatter is H4 to MI times this minus the complex conjugate. So let me take the irrelevant, the constant ones out, f mod squared, r, r squared. Now what is the complex conjugate of this thing? This changes sign. It's the same. When I subtract these from each other, this minus the minus, so twice ik. Again, some cancellations. I cancel h bar k divided by m times 2 pi to the minus 3 halves f mod squared r r squared. Again, as a beautifully simplified expression. So I have to multiply this with the r squared to substitute in the differential cross-section expression. So let me write the differential cross-section now. d sigma, the omega, the numerator is this times r squared and mod. So h bar k divided by m, 2 pi to the minus 3, f mod squared, f, sorry, mod squared, Time the mod of this unit vector is 1. Uh, if when I multiply the r squared, this r squared go, gone away. Divided by a numerator was quite simple. h bar, the magnitude, because j incident, that was the vector. So h bar k over m, 2 pi to the minus 3. Isn't this amazing? A beautifully clean expression, everything goes away, what is left over is the f squared. So this way of introducing the scattering amplitude f is really very handy, very appropriate, because once you know it, then you can determine all the physics. The physics is contained in the differential cross-section. Remember this uh, particular definition of cross-section in the scattering problem is slightly different than the previous one that we have introduced when we were discussing the electromagnetic radiation. There it was the ratio of two energies, right? The energy absorbed divided by the incident uh, energy flux. Here it's the number of particles that we are taking in the ratio. So that's why it's, it looks slightly different, the construction of the cylinder and the, and the content of it. In the electromagnetic energy and at atoms, the external radiation case, it was content of the cylinder was energy. Here, the content of the cylinder is the number of particles. Okay, that's the difference. So you have to, you don't have to get confused about that. So that shows that if you know the wave uh, scattering amplitude, you can really easily compute scattering differential cross section, and this is what is measured in the laboratory. Experimentalists are measuring this one. Okay, so let me move to a next subject, which is the so-called Born approximation. Born approximation. It is obtained by May I Yes, of course. How can we use classical counterparts by dealing with the quantum mechanical system? Well, you know, the quantum mechanical and classical uh, quantities are related to each other through the correspondence principle 
in the following way. You take the expectation values or the averages of the quantum mechanical quantities, you get the classical things. But here our concern is the number of particles, the ratio of the number of Correct. 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 But notice that how the velocity is entered, expectation values or average velocities, the number of particles crossing, falling into the target area per unit area per unit time. And what is the, uh, the argument, intuitive argument to construct it? You consider a cylinder of unit area, bases with unit area, and height. Only those particles which are how far away from that surface can cross. If it is per unit area, the average velocity is the height of the cylinder. When the average velocity is entered in both the incident and the scatter, that's how the quantum mechanical quantities enter using correspondence principle. So that was the point which I was really sort of killing myself of passing through. Okay, so that's, that's the profound statement. As I said, you could, as some authors, some books do, you write this as a plausibility argument, but that's nonsense. I don't like it that way. You say, normally the, the velocity expectation values of the, the average velocities are associated with the current densities. You take the, the ratios of the currents. No, that's not the explanation. The explanation is the one which I have given to you. Okay, so Born approximation is a very trivial one, but again, a very difficult to comprehend, really. Mathematically easy, but conceptually difficult to understand. Let me explain why I do think so. Let's write down, copy that complicated expression of the scattering amplitude. Even I cannot keep that in my mind, it's rather with the, all the coefficients and the pi's and sines and all that. Remember phi f less 2m over h bar squared times 2 pi to the 3 halves divided by 4 pi d cube x prime e to the i k prime x prime v of x prime times psi of x prime. And we have rewritten it in the following manner. 2 pi cube divided by, we have written it about half an hour ago, so it's in your notebooks. I'm just copying it again. K prime V sine. These two expressions are identical, and we have demonstrated that the second follows from the first, but actually we have chosen the easy way. We have followed demonstrated that first follows from the second one. Doing it the other way around requires an additional two minutes. I challenge you, please <laughs> do the converse. Go from the first to the second, and you have to few, spend a few more minutes for that. But obviously these are trivial mathematical st steps. Now, <laughs> the algorithm, which I will explain when I discuss the recursion relations rigorously, the argument is that when the V is weak enough or not strong enough, whichever way you prefer, when V is weak enough, you can, what is the lowest, well, remember the full equation, Lipman-Schwinger equation, what is the, in the left-hand side, psi plus minus phi, is equal to e to the ikr divided by r times this. In the right hand side there is yet this unknown. Let's not get confused, it is in here. What is the psi plus that I can think of in the right hand side in this integral equation? We claim that the lowest in the, under the, in, in the integrand The lowest means, not as a magnitude, but as compared to nothingness, psi plus is phi. It straightly goes through. If it is integral equation, we have to, if we have to think of recursively, then you take this, uh, the very lowest 
untouched, going through the solution and feedback in the right hand side. So that is the plane wave. In the integrand, if you replace, replacing psi plus with phi, the plane wave. Because the plane wave going through untouched is the lowest, and no interaction case, no scattering, no interaction. Then you take that and feed in here. In that, in that, that version corresponds to the Born approximation. So obviously, psi plus, which was there in a hideous manner, disappears and it becomes a trivial solution. When it's psi plus is replaced with the phi, then this approximation is called the Born approximation. So we write it as 2m over h bar squared, 2 pi to the 3 half powers divided by 4 pi, d cubed x prime e to the pi k prime x prime, v of x prime, then e to the i k x prime divided by 2 pi to the 3 halves. You see it is this thing which is replacing psi plus x prime. Little thing for you to think about. Why it is k but not k prime? I said it goes through untouched. I take it to be the lowest and feed in right. So that's why a subtle, a mathematically trivial but physically subtle thing. So it is k in here, not k prime. Because when you see the prime quantities, you may say it's k prime, right? So that k prime kills that k prime. Dynamics is more, half of the dynamics is gone. So this expression is indeed becomes rather nice and a very powerful expression, but of course, there's an assumption which went into this. If it is weak enough, and we are going to quantify that, what does it mean to be weak enough? What are the conditions to be satisfied, mathematical conditions to justify this assumption? We are going to go through that. But let me use, let me write the expression now. Fb minus 2m over h bar squared there is 2 pi 3 halves up, 2 pi 3 halves down, they nicely cancel so there is 1 over 4 pi d cube x prime e to the i k x minus X prime, of X prime. Well, quantum mechanics, or the actual mechanics, it's so beautiful and so full of such pleasant surprises. What is this expression? Well, this expression is nothing but up to constants. Fourier integral transform of the V. So you, V is given, you take the Fourier integral transform of it, you get the scattering amplitude. Isn't that amazing? Out of all the sudden, out of nowhere, this beautiful thing follows. Then you take the mode square of this, you get the differential cross section. Potential is given, thus F is given by taking a, such a stupid mathematical operation of Fourier, Fourier integral transform. Then V is given, F is given, F is given, the differential cross section is given like that. Well, of course, as I said, this is a, a very strong approximation and you'll see that under certain circumstances it can be satisfied and under certain circumstances it cannot be satisfied. Therefore, let's take advantage of the, the simplicity of this expression and let's see whether we can compute several examples. Uh, for instance, if V is spherically symmetric, special case, V is V of R 
it's going to simpl simplify it's going to simplify of course very uh, substantially let's demonstrate that let's give this a name I'm sorry, yes, yes, of course, you call it that. K minus K prime times S. Otherwise, it would be talking nonsense. Now you can drop the primes of the X's because there is no confusion. It's a dummy integration variable anyway. So in this special case, then if we uh, take this momentum difference, this is the vector momentum difference. Magnitudes are the same, therefore, so it is the, because it's, uh, there is a deviation in the angle. So let's call this Q, this momentum difference, to simplify the notation. So Fb becomes minus 2m over h bar squared, 1 over 4 pi d omega dr r squared is the usual measure v of r e to the i q r but let me just choose this integration dummy integration space to be in such a way that the third axis is chosen to be parallel to the Q. Q is a physical thing which is provided to you. Therefore, this is the X vector. Here is the theta measured from the third axis. And nothing depends on this angle phi. You can carry out this angle. So Fb becomes minus 2m over h bar squared times 1 over 4 pi was out there already. And the phi angle here can be carried out. And what is left over is the, the theta, sine theta. So let me leave the dr r squared here, never forgetting that that's the half line. And there is the dxc from minus 1 to plus 1. e to the i q r c. I I call the xi cosine theta is xi, right? e to the sine theta is d cosine theta, cosine theta is xi. All these things are now trivial mathematical steps, so you don't dwell on it too much. So what is this integral? This is i. 1 over i q r times e to the i q r minus e to the minus i q r. Now, R cancels one of them, and the other comes out. So it is minus 2m over h bar squared. There is a 2 in here. That 2 cancels that, so m of, OK. Minus m over h bar squared times 1 over i q dr r vr e to the i q r minus e to the minus i q r is the form of the expression, so zero to infinity. Well, let me not pursue it any further. Just for the heck of it, let's write it 2i times cosine and cosine cancels. There is i times sine and i times sine. 2i times sine qr, qr. And that i cancels this i. So it is minus m over 2h bar squared q times dr r vr sine q 
QR is the intermediate form that we should really just stop in here. Why? Because we don't know the explicit form of the V. All we know is that it is centrally symmetric. So you see, this is sine. Please let's give the sign of QR. So once V is known, you can immediately use this expression to carry out the integrals and get the FB. Then you have the differential cross-section automatically. So this was the general formal discussion. Let's go to an example. The example is going to be the Yukawa potential. Let me write it in such a way that eventually I can take the limit to go to the Evet, two should be up. Thank you very much. Because that gives you two, two comes up, not down. So V is V0. Let me use the book's notation so that we can compare against V0 e to the minus mu r divided by mu r. Well, this potential is something like this. Starts here, then goes down. Rather sharp. Here at the r equals mu, this is e to the minus one uh, times r squared. r equals one over mu. So v zero e to the minus one here, or it goes one over one. Well, it once in the 1930s, this was proposed at, at a time where we didn't really know much, well, not much, but anything about the, the atom, the, the micro world. And what, for example, was binding neutron and proton together in a nucleus and which gives you a stable nucleus. It was a, nothing was known really. There was no standard model, no quantum chromodynamics, chromodynamics, no nothing. And people were doing it by hand waving arguments. Therefore, this was the potential which was proposed by Yukawa, which eventually has received the Nobel Prize for this. Uh, which, this was a model and uh, nowadays it's an uh, approximate model, of course, not, uh, has nothing to do with the standard model. He said that the proton and neutron, there was a binding force between them, different than any kind of other forces, because neutron is neutral, so it's, it cannot be electromagnetism, a different type of force. Through the exchange, exchange of a new intermediate particle, he called, I, I don't know what he called originally, it, it was called, soon it was called pion. So this was the model mimicking the proton-neutron force. Here is the proton, here is the neutron. And there was an exchange of pion. So this mu was sort of the mass of the pion through the estimations. It came out to be around 130 MeVs, about 250 or 260 times heavier than the electron. So you see, we have come a long way since 1930s and 40s. This was the model of explaining the nuclear stability. So it has historical value. And when you take the mu goes to zero limit by being careful to keep the V0 over mu constant, it, it goes to the Coulomb potential. However, this is a safer potential than the Coulomb potential to discuss in this framework. Now you may say, what? It's a rather profound statement. Why do I say so? Well, obviously, they, 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 thanks to the fact that mu is very large, 130 million electron volts, and this is a very sharp thing, goes to zero rather fast. So you can think of the range to be at the order of one Fermi again, and beyond the one Fermi, it wouldn't really go away, go outside of the nucleus. Whereas the Coulomb potential is one over R. In principle, it can reach to the infinity. 
Why Coulomb potential is problematic? You see, all the simple things are problematic in this context. Plane wave free particle was problematic because of normalization. Coulomb pro potential is problematic because it violates the assum one assumption I have done in here, locality. We said, in approximation, we said potential is localized into short distances so that the detector, distance to the detector as compared to the scale of the range of the potential was very large or vice versa. Now, Coulomb potential can in principle reach to the detector one over R, nothing to confine it, to suppress it. But this one is suppressed, thanks to this. Very suppressed, it doesn't reach to the area of detection, region of detection. So let's take this and try to compute the <coughs> scattering amplitude in the Born approximation regime. You see, we have to use the careful language. It is not the scattering amplitude ever, forever. It is only for this regime and we have to justify under what circumstances this, this is really valid. So Fp is what? Fp is 2 minus 2m over h bar squared q <coughs> dr r vr, which is v0 e to the minus mu r divided by mu r, I substitute v in here, times sine qr, sine qr. The r cancels and we have minus 2m over h bar squared q. Let's take v0 over mu out. And what is left over dr, e to the minus mu r, times sine of qr, integral zero to infinity. What is sine of qr? If I consider the i qr, its real part is cosine qr, its imaginary part is sine qr, right? So if I can write this as imaginary part of sine qr, as everything else is real, I can take the imaginary sign out. So I can write this as imaginary part of integral dr e to the i q r i q minus mu r integral zero to infinity. Understood? Nothing, uh, no danger of pulling the imaginary, sign, imaginary notation out because as I said, this is real, it jumps over, it doesn't do any harm. The advantage of this, of course, I can integrate this rather easily, right? What is this integral then, inside integral? It is one over I, one over I Q minus mu times e to the I Q minus mu. Oh, by the way, sorry. Times, the value of this at the infinity Whatever this oscillating factor is, mu is positive, that r is positive infinity, that due to the minus sign is zero. Minus one, so minus one. Get r equals zero. So, then I will take the imaginary part of this. How do I do that? I will take the, including the minus one, I take imaginary part of one over mu minus iq. Right? Putting the minus sign in makes it a mu minus iq. The usual trick is multiply the denominators, conjugate up and down. And so it is the imaginary part of mu plus iq divided by mu squared plus q squared. Then it is q divided by mu squared plus q squared. That's the imaginary part of it. Nice. <clears throat> then we are finished. Let me write the FB is minus 2m over h bar squared q, q divided by mu squared plus Q squared, though those Qs cancel, 
So we have minus 2m over h bar squared, 1 over mu squared plus q squared. And we had also v0 over mu in here, v0 over mu minus v0 over mu 2m over h bar squared. So that's the expression. It's a nice and simple expression, obviously. So if you want to get the differential cross-section, then you take just the, the sigma over the omega is f b squared. So it is 4m squared divided by, well, anyway, there's no need to write it explicitly. h squared squared v0 over mu squared times 1 over q squared plus mu squared squared. So that is the differential cross-section for the Yukawa potential. Notice that v0 over mu is entering and it is the, you, you can check the, for instance whether it indeed has the dimension of area and how does it behave with the scattering angle. In order to see the behavior with the scattering angle, let me compute the q explicitly. What was Q? It was defined as the momentum difference, right? So Q squared is K squared plus K prime squared minus twice K K prime cosine theta. Remember this is elastic scattering and K and K prime magnitudes are the same. Therefore, this is 2 K squared and that's also 2 K squared. Sorry, that's 2k, k, k, 2k dot k prime, so it is k squared cosine theta because the magnitudes are the same. So altogether, 2k squared times 1 minus cosine theta. So cosine theta is decomposed in terms of the half angles. So you have 4k squared sine squared theta over 2. Okay. 4k squared sine squared theta over 2. So it is this q squared in here. Normally, or naively, to go to the Coulomb limit, you say, let's kill two birds in single shot by taking the mu goes to zero, therefore you recover one over r. As I said, you have to be very careful. It's not that easy. You have to keep the v0 over mu constant. So mu is going to zero, v zero is going to zero as well. That is a very rather subtle uh, reg regularization procedure in here. But if you forget that, and if you are be behave a bit childishly in here, if you let mu goes to zero, the q squared becomes sine squared to theta over two, square of it sine to the four. Well, this one over sine to the four theta over two indeed is a signature of Coulomb scattering, right? provided that you keep the v0 over mu, there is another mu in here, constant. So you can indeed go to the Coulomb case, replacing the v0 over mu with zz prime e squared divided by h. Then. But my, my point is, <clears throat> my point is to justify now why we can really do this Born approximation and are there any limitation to it or under what condition it's not really true? That is after the break.